And the book of Hosea is one of the most amazing books. Um, there was a season, some of you probably have seen videos and heard my testimony, um, but back in 2000, the end of 2002, beginning of 2003, I came from Massachusetts down to Texas, broke, homeless, divorced, bankrupt, and ready to put a bullet in my head. And, you know, it was in a really rough place, living out of my car, living in a Dodge Stratus. And right before I entered that homeless season, God kept putting homeless people in, in my path. Like I was seeing them everywhere. I mean, they probably were always there, but I didn't, I guess, maybe notice them. Um, and he was really laying it on my heart. I would, I would just see them, and I'm like, oh. And for a while there, after the bankruptcy, it was really difficult, didn't have any money. Finally got a, a job that was a freelance job, made a little bit of money, and I had to run an errand for the guy that hired me. He gave me his van to go to the post office. I'm heading to the post office, and I see this homeless guy on the side of the road there, and I had just cashed my check, hadn't had money in a while. I'm like, yeah, yeah I finally got some money, and God says, give it to him. I'm like, are you kidding me? I just, really? <laughs> you know? So, anyway, you know, I, you know, I saw him there, and I got to the post office, and the whole time I'm waiting in line, he's telling me, I mean, this money in my pocket's burning a hole in, in my pocket, and it's like, you gotta give it to that guy. And I said, all right, Lord, all right, all right. I said, I said, all right, but I don't wanna just enable some guy that's got an alcoholic or drug problem or something. So, if he's one of those guys, Lord, I'm just praying for confirmation here. I hear you, I wanna obey you, but I don't wanna, you know, if this guy's just gonna, you know, drink it away or whatever. I want it to really help him. So if he really genuinely needs it, let him still be there when I come out of the post office. You know, have him still be there. If he's going to just be, use it for whatever, have him just wander off or something, you know. So I came out, and he's still there. I'm like, uh, okay. So I, I go to the guy. I says, uh, come on over. I said, why don't you sit? It was a hot day. I said, why don't you come into the van and sit with me? So I cranked up the AC. He's sitting with me. And I said, you know, I want to help you, but I want to know your story for, first. What's your deal? So he tells me what, what led to him being homeless, and as I'm listening to him, it was my story. He was telling me my story. And I start crying, and he's like, what's the matter, dude? I said, I'm, I'm about to be where you are. <laughs> and he turns to me, he goes, you need to read the book of Hosea. <laughs> I'm like, what? It's like Habakkuk, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> you know we're New Testament Bible-believing Christians, who reads those books, you know? I'm like, what? So he starts preaching to me for like a half hour on the book of Hosea. And I'm like, wow, you know, okay. So, I mean, it, by the time it was over, we're both crying and everything. I ended up, you know, praying with him and he prayed with me and I gave him the money and, you know, said, see you later. And as he got out of the, out of the van, I, I just said a quick prayer. I'm like, wow, Lord, you know, you put him here to minister more to me than for me to help him. And so I, it was just a quick thank you. And I, I looked back and he was gone. You know, I couldn't see him anywhere. I'm thinking, oh, okay. <laughs> Is this one of those angels unaware things, you know? Turns out it wasn't. He ended up calling me like a year or so later. Uh, I, I had given him my number. And, and um, uh, he ended up starting a homeless shelter to help other people. And he says, you know, I just want to let you know where the seed went that you planted in me. And, you know, he ended up calling me and encouraged me a long time later. But, but God put that person in my life at a time just before I was about ready to become homeless. And I really believe you reap what you sow in like kind. If you sow an apple seed, what, kind of, what, kind of, what are you going to get out of it? Apple tree, right? So when I was helping these homeless people, I didn't really know that I was going to become homeless and, and it ended up other people. It came back to me, you know? So, but it came back even greater a number of years later. I couldn't receive everything that the Lord had to show me in the book of Hosea at that time. But Doug talked about divorce, right? And it says God hates divorce. Well, I never really understood that until I had to go through it. And you understand how incredibly painful it is. And we're created in his image and what? Likeness. So the emotions and things that we feel, he, he feels. And I know how much pain that I went through, through the infidelity and her being with somebody else and you know, all that. I know what it did to me. And then all of a sudden, now, years later, after I got healing through that, I could see what it was doing to God all through the prophets. He is hurt, really hurt, until he finds peace. And he illustrates it so beautifully. I feel sorry for this guy, this prophet, Hosea. He said, when the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. 
And then you keep reading in Hosea 1, and it says, Yet the time will come when Israel's people will be like the sands of the seashore, too many to count. Then at the place where they were told, You are not my people, it will be said, You are children of the living God, and the people of Judah and Israel will unite together. This was the beginning of me beginning to see what Doug talked about in the previous session, that there's, there's two here. There's Israel and Judah, and he's got a very specific plan to unite them together right there. They will choose one leader for themselves, and they will return from exile together. What a day that will be, the day of Jezreel, when God will again plant his people in whose land? His land. How many of you have seen this video right here? Identity crisis. Ooh, man, if you haven't, write it down. <laughs> you need to watch this video. Uh, this video was by Jim Staley, and it really opened my eyes to who we are. I got saved at seven years of age. Grew up in a Baptist uh, family. My dad was a Baptist minister, in fact, when I was a kid. Got saved at age seven. Been in some form of ministry my entire life. I didn't get it. I didn't have a clue. I thought I did. Five, six years ago, you couldn't have told me otherwise. But after I saw this and realized who I am and what he did, whoo, boy, I cried like a baby when I watched this. Because now all of a sudden the whole Bible made sense. I mean, because we did have this idea that really the New Testament applied to us. And, you know, the other stories are cool for Sunday school, you know, the Old Testament stuff. Uh, but that's all for the Jews. Oh, no. It, it, it's one complete book. <laughs> I tore out, in fact, I tore out the commercial interruptions in my Bible, the two uninspired pages, the one that says Old Testament and New Testament. So now it goes right from the table of contents to the maps, and all of it's suddenly applicable as you go through it. After I saw that, it kind of rocked my world because I came from a very hardcore pre-trib rapture dispensationalist background. That was me, hardcore. Then I saw this one by 119 Ministries, the era of dispensationalism. If you haven't seen that, Write it down. You need to watch that one. Uh, that began a whole paradigm shift in a lot of things. And, and um, Doug and I kind of came off the pre-trib rapture page pretty close to the same time. In fact, he put me on the spot one time. We were, we were at a dispensationalist pre-trib rapture style conference <laughs> where like everybody there is on that page. And it was before the conference started and we, we all gathered together for, for dinner. And so we're all sitting at the table and Doug goes, so Rob, where are you on the pre-trib rapture? <laughs> issue and I'm looking at everybody else at the table and I'm going this is a setup I said hold that thought I got to use the bathroom this is a lengthy conversation I'll be right back so I went used the bathroom came back and said okay first why did you ask me that <laughs> why are you asking this question and he said because I can't find any evidence of it in the scripture and I'm like well funny you should say that because neither can I and you know a big part of that, I mean, dispensationalism is the crutch that the preacher of rapture camp needs. They have to have it. Because otherwise, you don't know what to do with Matthew chapter 24, where it says, plain as day, in fifth grade reading level English, after the tribulation of those days, right, you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Where does Paul say we meet him in the rapture? In the clouds? Well, the only time Jesus said he's going to be in the clouds is after the tribulation of those days. So, but those were the kinds of scriptures that we had to conveniently ignore while well, you know, he was talking to the Jews. And I always had a problem with that because at the beginning of Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus, hey, what are the signs going to be like before you come back? Well, don't you think a massively huge sign to mention would be, hey, when you see millions of people flying up into the sky like Superman, <laughs> then you're going to know the next seven years are going to be really bad. <laughs> Funny, he left that detail out. Yeah, that's a huge sign to conveniently forget about. You know, but those, we, well, he's talking to the Jew. You know, even if he was talking to the Jew, he should have told them, hey, when you see the Christians flying up, you know. Uh, but you, 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 you quit, once you figure out who you are in Christ through the grafting and adoption process that Paul talks about, some of this stuff becomes easier to throw away because now you start to understand some things. Um, and I had to ditch a, a lot of the dispensationalism stuff that I had uh, so deeply ingrained in me um, that was part of me. Then I saw this one. Oh, man. I had uh, 
I had run down the stairs. I, was, I wanted to go see a movie that had just opened, and I, I was in a hurry, so I'm like, yeah, I got like 10 minutes to get to the theater. So I ran down the stairs, missed the last one, snapped my foot in like three places, and busted my foot, and I crawled back up the stairs. Like, oh, I busted my foot. <laughs> um, so of course, I had to have surgery and everything. And um, uh, that particular weekend, I wasn't able to go to our Shabbat service to do our normal Bible study with our home group. So I was laid up in bed with my foot up and everything. I thought, well, I'm going to find something to watch, a good teaching. And so I, and, uh, 119 had just put this one out, nailed to the cross. And if I thought I wept like a baby when I saw Identity Crisis, this was like a river, just uncontrollable. Because in that video right there, they explained what the cup was that Yeshua had to drink from. You ever think about that? He's in the garden, and he says, let this cup pass from me. Well, we just kind of write it off as uh, it's an interesting metaphor. You know, he's got this cup of suffering, you know, he's about to endure. No, it's a real cup. Not, not necessarily a physical one that he actually, you know, grabbed hold of and drank. But there was a Torah principle that was at work there. That, how many of you know that, that there's the cup of bitter waters that for the adulterous wife or the, one, the woman who's suspected of adultery? The husband who's, who believes his wife has cheated on her can call for the cup of bitter waters for her to drink from it. And if she's not guilty, it doesn't do anything to her. But if she is guilty, what happens to her? Her stomach swells and her thighs begin to rot. And what they did is illustrated how that's exactly what happened to Yeshua on the cross and what crucifixion does to your body and how your abdomen swells and how just to breathe, you have to every breath, you have to push up on the spikes, a symphony, an orchestra of pain every time you have to breathe just to exhale until, I mean, how many of you have had a Charlie horse, a cramp? Magnify that by about a billion. A person dies on the cross through exhaustion when their thighs give out. And how many pieces of silver was he purchased for? Anybody know what the 30 pieces of silver is the price for? No, in, in the Torah. It's the price of a woman. He was sold for the price of a woman. A man is uh, 50 pieces, I believe. So Yeshua was purchased for the price of a woman. Now we know that he, he, we always say, well, he, he became, I really be, believe he became the sin offering for us uh, on that cross. But he paid the price for the adulterous bride. Christ loved us, right, and gave himself for who? The church, right? Now, in dispensation theology, we're taught that the church didn't show up until Acts chapter 2. Well, how does that make any sense? How could Yeshua die for something that didn't yet exist? Stephen tells us in Acts chapter 7 that the church was in the wilderness. Uh-oh, the church is Israel. In the beginning of his ministry, he's in Judea talking to the Jew... And he says, I have only come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Whoa, the adulterous bride. The cup that he was praying would pass from him was the cup of bitter waters that he knew. He, the, he, he, he was playing the part, taking the punishment of the adulterous bride. Wow. Whew. Man. Because of the whoring, prostitution, of the northern kingdom of Israel, we see in Jeremiah 3, he divorced her, right? This is the scripture I just referred to, Matthew 15, 24. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So if as most of us have been taught, the church didn't show up until 50 days after the resurrection at the Pentecost of Acts 2, how... Can we make sense of the scripture where Paul says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. If the church didn't even show up till 50 days later. Doesn't make any sense at all, does it? There was a law, and Doug talked about it so beautifully in his session there, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly here, but there was a law established in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Right, where he says if a husband, you know, and he divorces and she goes with some other man, he cannot take her back. 
Can't do it. Can't take her back because it's an abomination. And yet you see all through the prophets, okay, I'm going to divorce you, but I'm going to win her back once again. So yeah, I mean, you know, Doug said it too. It's, it, the angels had to have been up there in heaven going, huh? Uh, how, how, how are you going to do that? How are you going to? You said in your own law that you can't do that. So how is that going to work? Well, we, we already figured it out, right? The only way the husband could take back the bride he had divorced without breaking his own law would be to die for her. That's the great mystery. In dispensation theology, we, we, we always hear that, you know, Paul figured out the mystery of the church. You know, it was concealed in the Old Testament or revealed in the New Testament. Have you heard that? Nonsense. It's all over the Old Testament. The church, the congregation, the ecclesia, it's all, all over the Old Testament, from, especially from the time of, uh, of Sinai. Right? We see it all over the place there. The mystery was how could he take her back after he divorced her? And that's why I get, you know, people, we talk about Hebrew roots, and I, I, if you follow me on Facebook or anything, you know I always distance myself from the title. I don't like the title of the Hebrew roots movement, even though I believe we are going after our Hebrew roots. But the reason I do is because there are certain personalities within the so-called official movement that have decided to throw Paul out. They think Paul is a heretic, that he, that he failed the Deuteronomy 13 test. And many of them are, are getting rid of Yeshua, too. They're dropping Jesus in the whole New Testament. There's a whole YouTube channel on 10 reasons why I reject Jesus in the New Testament. And all these former Christians are now in the Hebrew roots thing and completely getting rid of the New Testament, Paul, and Jesus. I don't want, nothing to, I don't want anything to do with that, so don't put a label on me. You know, uh, if you're going to say Hebrew roots, then it comes with all the baggage sometimes of some of these other personalities that I don't want to associate with. I love Paul. I never understood Paul before because it seems like he contradicts himself so many times. But I, I, I've become fond of saying you can't understand what Paul wrote until you understand what Paul read. We call ourselves New Testament Bible-believing Christians, but that's like going to Barnes & Noble or you know, Amazon.com and ordering the greatest best-selling novel of all time, skipping three-quarters of the book and starting in the last 25% and thinking you have any clue who the main characters are, what their motivation is, or why anybody's doing anything. If we don't understand what's going on in the Old Testament, what's going on with the divorce, and what's going on with the reconciliation, and how he's going to bring the two back together, we are clueless. We have no idea who we are or what Yeshua actually did for us. That's the mystery of the church. And, and once your eyes are sort of open to it, I mean, we've read, we've read these verses before. Some of you may have even highlighted it, maybe put an annotation next to it, but we didn't really understand it before. You know, he talks about that in 1 Corinthians 7, 39. But if her husband is dead, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. And Romans 7 is like just amazing. But you notice that he says, I'm speaking to those who know the law. So unless you understand the Torah, specifically Deuteronomy 24, you have no idea what he's saying in the rest of, well, really, Romans chapter 7 through chapter 11. I would contend that if you don't understand what's going on with Deuteronomy 24 and Jeremiah chapter 3 and the book of Hosea, you shouldn't even read anything Paul wrote because you're not going to have a clue what he's talking about. You re I didn't, even though I had it all highlighted and annotated and preached on it before. <laughs> didn't have a clue. You know, I think the Holman Christian Standard Bible renders that particular verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 4, a little clearer. Therefore, my brothers, you also were put to death in relation to the law which law? The whole law? Or just like Doug point out, the law of the bride, right? Through the crucified body of the Messiah, so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. Who was raised from the dead? Right. That we may bear fruit for God. Hosea talks in chapter 2, verses 17 through 20. O oh, Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal from your lips, and you will never mention them again. I long for that day. You know, I don't get all crazy about, you know, um, in, like in the sacred name movement. Some people get all really you know, wrapped around the axle about things. But I, I love it when, you know, I grew up in a King James only environment. And I read the King James. I've studied it since age seven. It's my preferred study Bible to this day. But when they try to tell me it is perfect and literal word for word translation, I'm going, word for word? How in the world can you say that when they replace the holy name of God over 6,000 times? 6,000 times, over 6,000 times. 
They took the name of God out and put a title, which basically means Baal. Or Baal means the Lord. Ah, that just, you know. I think it's important that we know his name. You know, uh, we, we, I don't think God gets upset that we're pronouncing it wrong. If we're saying Yahweh, Jehovah, Yahuwah, whatever, he's happy that we're at least trying to say his name. We're, we're doing the best we can with consonants, you know. Um, but he's going to wipe away the names of the Baals, and he's going to make you his wife again, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine, and you will finally know me, not as the Lord. It just says I'm going to wipe the names of the Baals out of here. <laughs> ah, you will finally know. I love it it says, my name is the Lord. The Lord is my name. That's not a name. That's a title. But when we talk about the Baals of the world, this is what we're talking about. You know, um, and I would contend that most of these go right back, directly back to Nimrod. And I'll talk about that more in tomorrow's session. Um, yeah, Hosea 2, 22 through 23. Then the earth will answer the thirsty cries of the grain, the grapevines and olive trees, and they in turn will answer Jezreel, God plants. At that time, I will plant a crop of Israelites and raise them for myself. I will show love to those I called not loved, and to those I called not my people, I will say, now you are my people, and they will reply, you are our God. Who is he talking about? Israel, right? Oh, well, now all of a sudden you know what Paul's talking about. Because he's quoting Hosea. Yeah, whoops. You know, I just got into a debate with somebody on Facebook about this whole Gentile thing. You know, I'm like, don't call me a Gentile, I'm not a Gentile. I was born a Gentile, but according to Romans, if I've accepted Yeshua as my Savior, I'm grafted into the cultivated olive tree. I mean, like, Paul breaks it down for us if you just read him. I mean, go ahead and make a, you know, kindergarten picture for you if you have to. You know, if you were not blood-born into the house of Israel, then you're of the wild olive tree over here. You know, if you are born blood into the house of Jacob, then you are of the cultivated olive tree with Hebrew roots. Right? But if you don't believe in Yeshua, what happens to your branch? Right? But if you're over here in the cultivated with uh, uh, the, the wild olive tree with pagan roots, but you do believe in Yeshua, what happens? Well, you get grafted in. Or if you are a blood-born Israelite that previously didn't know Yeshua and decide you want to accept Yeshua, what happens to you? Get put back in. But there's only one tree. There's only one church. It's Israel. And I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, Doug touched on this also, Ephraim and Judah. And basically, you know, and Doug and I have had conversations offline about this before. It's like, in the past, we kind of had this view that there were two brides, right? One for God, Israel, and one for Jesus, Christians. You know, no. God has one people, one bride, one plan, which has never changed. John Nelson Darby is the one who invented the bogus trans, uh, doctrine of dispensationalism, creating division where there never was before. What's ironic, though, is that most dispensationalists, when they hear me talking like this, they accuse me of talking about re replacement theology. I'm like, no, 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 no. If you believe this, you believe in replacement theology. If you believe for thousands of years it was Israel, 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 cross, boom, church. <laughs> That's replacement. Hello? You know, and even that I didn't really fully understand until I married Sheila. She had a 13-year-old son when we got married, and I adopted him and gave him my name. He didn't replace me. He was not a Skiba. Now he is a Skiba. He is heir to whatever my family has to leave for him. You know, he's part of my family now. He didn't replace me. He was grafted into my family, adopted. And that's what Paul's talking about, Romans 7 through 11 and Ephesians 2. Grafting, adoption, you know, that's what he's talking about. And what's interesting there is, and again, Doug touched on this also in Genesis 48, when Jacob crossed his hands with the blessing, right, over Ephraim and Manasseh, and it says that um, Ephraim will become the multitude of nations. Help me out with this, Doug. Uh, Milo Hagoyim, did I say it right? Yeah. Interestingly enough, Darby got that. He understood that. In his own translation, in Darby translation, he says that, that his seed will become the fullness of the nations, the fullness of the Gentiles. He got that. 
and yet his doctrine completely ignores that. Uh, we just covered that right there. That's the Gentiles right there. Concerning the Gentiles, this is quoting Hosea chapter 2. Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel. How many of you are married? Let that scripture sink in. <coughs> Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. Mm -mm. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. My first marriage ended because of infidelity. I went away on a six-day business trip, came home to an uh, empty house, let her divorce, and found out my wife of seven years was sleeping with some other guy up in Maine. Wow. We had taught Sunday school together, just did a passion play a few months earlier. I played Jesus and she played Mary. Hmm. Ripped my guts out. Who's forgiveness for? The person who offends or the one who was offended? Offended or offender? Offended. How many of you believe that? Forgiveness is for the person who was offended. Yeah, absolutely. One of the reasons I came down to Texas was because uh, my uncle who lived down there found out what was going on with me and wanted to sponsor me through a scripture-based uh, self-help program that taught forgiveness. Because my attitude was she doesn't deserve my forgiveness. Well, I mean, not forgiving somebody is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to get sick. You're only hurting yourself by, by not forgiving. You know, John, stand up. Okay? He's a bigger person than I am, right? Physically. Let's imagine John is the person that hurt me. What does my day look like? Well, you know, I wake up, you know, I take a shower, get dressed, and I strap John on my shoulders, and I drag him around all day long. <laughs> Wait, yeah. Yeah. How far am I going to get dragging him around on my back? Or anybody. Some of us have more than one person we're strapping on every day. Right? Thanks, John. Yeah. We're only hurting ourselves by not forgiving the other person. When I was going through the program, I was just so angry, so bitter that I couldn't get through it. You know, they're trying to teach me this principle, but I just I, I couldn't get through it. So they said, okay, fine, Rob, go grab your chair and hold it in the corner. I'm like, yeah, fine, whatever. So I grabbed my chair, stand in the corner, and there was like five people in the small group, and so they went and worked on the other four people, and it takes about 20 minutes or so for each person to kind of work through their stuff. They worked through everybody else and came over to me, and I'm still holding the stupid chair. <laughs> I'm sitting over in the corner, you know, and of course now I'm using my knee and I'm putting, you know, I'm compensating. My arms are shaking. They're like, what are you doing? Why are you still holding your chair? I said, because you told me to. You know, sit there. And they're like, well, do your arms hurt? I'm like, yeah. Do your muscles burn? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, they're killing me. And they said, well, what do you think all that unforgiveness is doing in your heart? It's burning you up. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I get it. You know, I understood what they're saying in principle, but I just couldn't get there. So they said, okay, well, you know, be, you know, they prayed for me or whatever, and then uh, they sent us on our way, and we had a few days between part one and part two the next weekend, and it's an opportunity for you to use your tools, right? So during that time, between parts one and two, those two weekends, I was at this fair, 140,000 people at this fairgrounds, and I went to Subway to buy a sandwich, and I walk out, boom, right into her. And it blows up into this huge fight, and right in the middle of the fight, all I can think of is that stupid chair. So I said to her, I said, stop, just stop. I grabbed her hand, I said, look, I forgive you. She says, for what, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> forgiveness is for me, forgiveness is for me, I'm gonna go take my chair. That showed me something right there. She didn't care. She moved on with her life. I could have given her a laundry list of things she did wrong, but she had justified it. How many of us justify, right? She felt that the marriage was just a piece of paper that we signed. And when I was away on the business trip, she went to annul that piece of paper by you know, getting a separation agreement. And so technically, in her mind, we weren't married anymore, so she was free to do whatever she wanted. That's not the point. 
she justified it. Forgiveness isn't for her in the first place. It's for me. When I finally understood forgiveness was for me so that I could have, what do you think the byproduct of forgiveness is? Peace. Peace. Right. Because before that, I was eating myself up alive from the inside out. Right. When I finally understood what forgiveness was, was when I reached the point of forgiveness. And it came for, for, from consciously making the, the, the decision to forgive what they did. And, you know, I understand what Peter said. Hey, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? Is that cool? Would that work? Would that work? 70 times seven? I don't think it's 490 times. I don't think that's the rule. I think it's as many times as it takes. Maybe it's 490 times an hour. It's as many times as you have to forgive until you've arrived at the byproduct, which is peace. I could talk about it. I could joke about it now. It's just a page in my history. I don't get upset about it. It doesn't cause that pain inside of me anymore. When I finally understood that for myself, in my own practical experience, forgiveness is for the one offended, all of a sudden that rocked my world a little bit because I thought, wait a minute, in my relationship with God, who's the offended and who's the offender? Is God the offender or the offended? Who's the offender? We're the offender, is he's the offended, who's forgiveness for? The offended or the offender? Oh, wait a minute, that's a little weird. I used to spend every day waking up begging God for forgiveness for everything I did yesterday so I could get through today without getting whacked. Because I had this view of God as sort of like Zeus with lightning bolts that just couldn't wait to whack me because I said a swear or something. But then when I realized, wait a minute, forgiveness is for the one who's offended, not for the offender. God's the offended, I'm the offender. Forgiveness is for him? What is that? Isaiah 43, 25 became my new favorite verse. God is speaking, and God says, I, yes, I alone am the one who forgives your sins for my own sake, and I'm never going to remember them again. Whew. Isaiah 43, 25. All of a sudden, when I saw that verse, the most important word in John 3, 16 became the word so. For God so loved the offending world that he sent his only begotten son to go. How many of you have seen the Passion of the Christ? I think Mel came close. Close to depicting how horrible that was. I know how hard it was for me to forgive those who offended me, who hurt me. How hard was it for God to forgive you? To forgive me? To drink that cup that made his abdomen swell and his thighs rot? to take the fist-pounding, smashing wrath that we deserved upon himself so that he could have peace. Wow. Just let that sink in for a little while. That's what he did for us. So then why do we ask for forgiveness? I believe that's reconciliation. He got peace with us 2,000 years ago. But think about the people who've hurt you in your life. Assuming you've already forgiven them, what would your forgiveness that you already have, the peace that you already have, what would that be like if that offending party called you up or knocked on your door one day, truly repentant, in tears, saying, I am so sorry. I know how bad I hurt you. Will you forgive me? How much sweeter would that peace be that you already have if they actually acknowledged the hurt they caused? See, then you have a reconciliation. You're accepting his forgiveness. Does that make sense? It's a whole new way, at least for me it was, of looking at the whole thing. Now, yes, we are all sinners. We all still transgress. We all do things wrong. But now my prayer is a little different. I don't wake up every morning now begging God for forgiveness for everything I did yesterday. I wake up every morning thanking God for forgiving me. Yeah, I acknowledge it, but thank you. It's a whole different mindset there. Hopefully that helps somebody here. <laughs> to obey or not to obey? That's the question. <laughs> he wants to tabernacle among us. We see that over and over and over again. He wants that same relationship that he had with us in the garden. I want to walk among you and I will be your God and you will be my people. Unfortunately today many think that Yahuwah's law is bondage. Think about that. Do you really believe that he just rescued the Israelites from the bondage of Egypt just to put them in bondage? The bondage of the Torah? 
And how does that make sense to anybody? It doesn't make sense. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I now have tremendous freedom and joy in obeying him. I feel more free now than I've ever felt. You know, for, when, I, when I get all wrapped up on the issues of the law and when you start to get that, that, that condemnation, the you know, devil likes to get, get on you and condemn you and, oh, you, you, know, you work past 8 p.m. on Friday, you know, whatever. You know, he tries to put those things on you, doesn't he? I go back to 1 John chapter 2 through 5. The, anytime it starts to get, because we're all prone to slide into that rabbinic Judaism kind of mindset. That's what they did. They, I think their intentions started out pretty good. But then they started adding all these other things onto the... So you basically, all you could do on a Sabbath was lay in bed and breathe shallow. <laughs> you know, and hope it's not cold outside. I mean, really. I mean, they, put such, they made it so burdensome to, to keep the Sabbath and so many other things. And we have the same problem. We, we, we can start getting really legalistic on things like that. And whenever that starts happening, I'm like, oh, wait, I'm going back to 1 John 2 through 5. Because he puts it all in perspective. You know, I'm writing these things to you, brethren, so you do not sin. But if you do, you have an advocate. Thank God I got an advocate. You know, and in 1 John 5, this is the love of God. It's about love. A friend of mine pointed something out. He said when he started coming into this understanding of who he was and realizing that the church began at Mount Sinai and that uh, that's where God married Israel, the Ten Commandments are not a do and don't list. They're a promise list. When you stood at the altar in front of your spouse to be, did you give a list of demands? I demand this, I command that. Did you do that? Or did you give, exchange vows, uh, promises? We exchange promises. And he suggested to me, he said, that's what God was doing with the Ten Commandments. He says, because, you know, we have the principle when a man and woman come together and the two come together in, one, uh, uh, in marriage, they become one flesh, right? Well, in our marriage with God, when we come into a covenant relationship with him and he comes and that literally lives inside of us, becoming one with us, well, if you've got God himself living inside of you, you're not going to kill people. You're not going to lie. You're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to have other gods before him, are you? It's a promise list. And that freed me up too. It's like, no, it's not, a, it's not a have to, got to. It's I get to. Because he's doing it in me, through me. He wants, he's written it on my heart, written on my mind. The Holy Spirit's inside me. Wow. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of freedom and joy there. Um, but if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these things, these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, that's what gets me right there. If, if you're having the same experience that I'm having, you probably got friends and family just going crazy on you because you have the audacity to want to <laughs> obey God. They act like they despise his commandments. Wow. You know, I'm just going to say it. You read First John 2 through 5, he says, if anyone says that they know him but doesn't keep the commandments, they are a liar and the truth is not in them. Wow. That's pretty harsh. I didn't say that. John said that. That's pretty harsh. But when you have these people that despise the statutes and their soul of horrors his judgments, they will not do all the commandments, but break the covenant. He says, then I'm going to point over you all kinds of stuff you don't want. So you can read through the list. It's not good. He's going to set his face against you. Wow, man. Then he says, and if you still won't listen to me after I chastise you, I'm going to get seven times, you're going to get seven times more the judgment on top of you. Huh. And he says that four times. Four times he says that you're going to get seven times the judgment. Could that be a reason why we have seal judgments, trumpet judgments, thunder judgments, bowl judgments? in a seven-year time period? Maybe it's a coincidence. Yeah, seven times more. However, he says, if they will confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, 
If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember, or will I remember, and I will remember the land, and I believe it's the land of Eden. He will remember it. Well, that brings us to a discussion of what's the deal with this Hebrew Roots movement in the first place. If you look at the captivity of Judah, he went in for, they went in for 70 years, right? But they learned their lesson. They repented and they got to go back in the land, didn't they? There's no evidence, however, that Ephraim ever repented. We read in Ezekiel 4 that his sentence, his judgment, was three, the prophet was to lay on his side for 390 days, a day for a year. 390 years was his judgment. But there's no evidence that Ephraim ever repented. So could it be that based on the principle of Leviticus that he got seven times the judgment? I think so. Uh, my friend Chad at our, one of our Bible studies pointed this out. He's like, well, wait a minute. So 390 years times of the initial judgment times seven equals 2,730 years. Now, I know some scholars differ on this. I got this stat from BibleStudyTools.com. 721 or 722 is usually the dates you hear of when Ephraim went into their captivity. Well, that's interesting. 2,730 years subtract 721 or 722 gets you 2009 or 2008. I don't know about you, well, let me just ask the question. How many of you would say you, you started to come into this understanding of Torah, started to keep the Sabbath, started to try to walk in his ways and do the feast somewhere about 2009 or there, thereabouts? Yeah. That's what I find everywhere I've been. All over the United States, I've asked the question. In Canada, I've asked the question. In South Africa, I've asked the question. And I'm not kidding, it's probably easily eight, out of, eight or nine out of 10 people will tell me roughly 2009 was the, the moment when they began to do that. And for many of them, and it may be the same for you, they came into this kind of a, awakening where, wow, the Old Testament's important all of a sudden. And you're wanting to get back into it and you have this hunger to study this stuff and do these things like never before. I mean, never did, was it any, even in my, on my radar. But prior to that, there was a season of two to three years in many cases, and sometimes more. I know for us is at least two to three years, where we had a season where everything, we church hopped. Every church we went to, we're like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's, what are they doing, what? Like, you know, and, I mean, for, we did church on the pillow for a long time. We're basically, we were like, there's no sense getting up and going anywhere. We'll just, uh, you know, go online and see if we can find somebody to listen to. And we did that for a little while. And, but even that, you know, because we're hearing the same thing out of the radio that we were hearing you know, from the sermon, you know, pulpits that we were going to. It was Black Friday, 2009. I hate Black Friday. Anyway, it's like on, we have Thanksgiving. Everybody's so thankful. Woo! Thankful for everything. And then you kill each other for Tickle Me Elmo, you know, the next day. Uh, you might just hate Black Friday. Um, but I was, at, I was at the parking lot of uh, Fry's Electronics, this big electronic superstore, and um, this heaviness fell on me. And I knew it was something more than just my distaste for Black Friday. And I'm like, Lord, what is this? I mean, it's this heaviness. And so I, I was like, God, what, what's the deal? And he says, you need to pray with somebody. So I said, okay. I went through my phone list, and I was going through my contact list, and, my, and God literally just stopped me at my friend Kevin. His, his name just kind of stood out to me. He said, okay, I'll call him. So I called Kevin, told him, I said, yeah, dude, I just need somebody to pray with. And so he prayed with me. And he says, uh, hey, uh, my wife and I are going to a Torah study at the Christian bookstore tomorrow morning. You want to go? I'm like, Torah study at the Christian bookstore? I mean, that just, what? But okay, whatever. I mean, nothing else was working for us, you know? So, um, you know, next morning, Saturday morning, we went to the Christian bookstore and they had a little room in the back and they were meeting. And it was the Torah portion. I think it's week nine, maybe where Joseph is sold into slavery. And the person facilitating the study said, draw a line down the center of your page and write Joseph on the left and Yeshua on the right and see how many parallels can you find between the life of Yeshua and the life of Jesus or, or, or Joseph. Oh, my battery's low. Why is it not plugged in? Because um, I didn't plug it in. There we are going. Uh, so I drew a line on a page with, with Joseph on the left and Yeshua on the right. Never thought about that that I can recall a day in my life. 
But just off the top of my head, I found 25 parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Yeshua. And when the whole group got to share with each other, we had over 50. I'm like, wow, this is, this is amazing. And then, of course, at the same portion we're studying, we have uh, Judah marrying a Canaanite, right? And, you know, all that. and if you know my Nephilim research, you know kind of my view on that. So we had a very lively discussion about the issue of the Canaanites and everything. And the, the class was divided as to whether or not Tamar was a Canaanite. And I was like, she can't be. There's no way, you know. And so I, I came home from that study, which was a very, we spent what, five hours on that study, came home, and I'm like, wow, it's always digging deeper than I, I was finally having a steak dinner when I was sucking on milkshakes for three years prior. You know, this was like amazing. I couldn't wait to get to the next door portion. And it just got better and better and better and better. And then we do our first Passover, and my mind just exploded with all the significant revelation that we were learning about the various aspects of, of Passover and how it related to my Savior. And, and then in the course of all that, I'm reading in Luke, uh, the last chapter of Luke, where uh, Yeshua is walking on the road to Emmaus with these guys that don't recognize him. And it says he began with Moses and the prophets to illustrate who he was. And I said, wait a minute. Now, I could have told you lots of things about my Savior from the Gospels and the Epistles of the New Testament. Sure, Isaiah 53 and Psalm 20, maybe, you know, 22 or whatever. Yeah, I could have given you a little bit, you know, a couple of verses maybe from the Old Testament, but I couldn't begin with Moses. And he says, if you don't believe him, Jesus says, if you don't believe him, you're not going to believe me because he wrote about me. And I'm like, wait a minute. I started praying. I said, Lord, can you reveal yourself to me through Moses the way you did those guys? And that began the journey that we're on now. Now he's all over it. I, I read through the Torah. This is our, we're going on our seventh cycle, Torah cycle. And every time it's something new, something amazing, mind-blowing revelation. There he is again. There he is again. There he is again. He's all over the thing. He's everywhere. I believe, and this is why, I, you know, I told you why I distanced myself from the title, the Hebrew Roots Movement. You know, you know, I gave you the reasons for that. But I believe we're in the Ephraim Awakening. When I saw this number pop up and looked at the journey that Sheila and I had been on, I just had this vision of the prodigal son, the specific moment when he woke up in the pig pen, surrounded by slop. And that, that, like, if I could just take a snapshot of that moment when he thought, what have I gotten myself into? I wonder if dad will take me back. And he began the journey to head back to his father. That was Ephraim's awakening. That's what I believe this is. We're just waking up. You know, this is why, again, I think we have more time. Because I think more people need to wake up. And we're still fighting about, is it new moon? Is it crescent moon? Is it conjunction moon? Is it even the moon at all? Lunar Sabbath, Friday, Friday, Saturday. Is it daytime or is it nighttime? Is it beginning at sunset or sunrise? You know, we're, we're fighting and having all... Why are we having all these difficulties? Well, we've been asleep for 2,730 years. And how many of you know if you, if you have a big family with a lot of siblings, nobody thinks the same way? You know, Simeon's going to have his own take on it. Reuben's going to have his take on it. Levi's going to have... They're all going to have sort of their own personality, right? I personally believe that if I'm not grafted... If I'm not physically in one of those bloodlines that I'm grafted into Ephraim. But even Ephraim and Manasseh, where'd they grow up? Egypt, right? My, this is just my opinion. I believe one of the reasons, one of the purposes of the two witnesses is to get us all in sync. Because we're doing this right now. Is it this, is it this? They're going to Because the scripture says it takes two to three witnesses to establish truth, right? Yeah. That's what, that's what lies ahead for us, I think. Right now, we're just waking up, and we're doing the best. And I think God is really happy and excited about that, especially when you read the book of Malachi. You know, in Malachi chapter 3, he talks about a book of remembrance, doesn't he? Anybody know what the book of remembrance is for? When, when do you get your name written in, or mentioned in the book of remembrance? When you do what? Think on his name. Right? So yeah, some are saying Yahweh, some Jehovah, some Yahuwah, Yehovah, whatever. 
God, this is like when you were a kid and you drew the best you could in crayon and you gave it to your parents and your dad's like, wow, this is amazing, and puts it up on his refrigerator. It looks like scribbles to him, but to you it's your masterpiece. And he's like, hey, that's awesome. You know, I think right now we're presenting scribble. <laughs> as best as some are better, more articulate and, you know, than others. But he's looking down at his children, trying to say his name right, trying to do what he said to do, walking it out as best we can as toddlers. I mean, you're looking at a seven-year-old up here. You know, I, I never say I got it all together. You know, I'm on a quest for truth. No, I don't have the corner on it. You know, trying to figure this stuff out. But that's where we're at. And he says, you know, he writes it us in the book of remembrance. Yes, we have the book of life and definitely want to be in that book. But I also want to be in the family album book too. The book of remembrance, you know, where he looked down on us lovingly and said, there's my children trying to, trying to love me, you know? And then you get to chapter four, man, you know, them that fear my name, you know, this is great. You know, remember the law of Moses. This is in a last day context. Malachi chapter four, remembering the commandments, right? Lest I smite the earth with a curse. Whoa, man. So what about Paul? What do we do with Paul then? We've all heard about it, right? Well, I would take people first to Acts chapter 24, where he's being put on trial, and he says, look, I confess that after the way, that was what Christianity was originally known as, right? The followers of Christ, the, the way, after which they call a heresy, or some translations say a cult, so worship I, the God of my fathers, believing all the things which are written in the law and the prophets. That's Paul. Paul saying that. I'll take people there. Or take them to Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. What is sin? Transgression of the law. Sheila and I were reading the Bible one morning, and it was the passage where the woman caught in adultery. You know, and you know the story that, you know, whoever's without sin and all that. And, uh, you know, where are your accusers? I don't have any. He says, okay, go and sin no more. Sheila says, you know, what, what if we looked at all those passages like that? Because, you know, she was caught in adultery. So he says, go and commit adultery no more. We can look at it that way. What if we look at the word sin by the biblical definition given, First John chapter 3, as transgressing the law? And what if we just put the biblical definition in over the generic word? So then you have Jesus saying, okay, go and transgress the law no more. It's not just nebulous, go and sin no more. It's go and transgress the law no more. I was, you know, that's interesting. So I went and I did a keyword search on all of Paul's writings, because Paul talks about sin a lot. Anybody who thinks Paul's against the Torah needs to do this experiment. Look at everywhere Paul uses the word sin and replace it with the biblical definition of transgression. You don't have much further to go than the next few verses. Chapter 6, let not transgression of the law, therefore, reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto transgression of the law, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For transgression of the law shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And that's another one. You're trying to get me under the law. Well, wait a minute. Hebrews 8.10 says the law is written on my heart. It's been put in me. How can I put you under something that's in you? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting pretzel. You know, I can't put you under something that's supposed to be in you. Right? The law is in you now. What then? Shall we transgress the law because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. And Paul has a lot more like that. If you just replace the word sin with the definition, you'll see Paul, he's definitely not an advocate for dissing the Torah. Well, yeah, but uh, Galatians. What about Galatians? <laughs> How many of you heard that one? Oh, foolish Galatian. Oh, yeah, well, if they want to take you to Galatians and say, yeah, let's go back to Galatians 1. Let's go through Galatians 1 together. If you go through Galatians 1, first of all, you see that he persecuted the church of God. Well, wait a minute. Many dispensationalists believe that the church today are the Gentiles because we got Israel for God and, you know, Christian is the church. That's what they think. Well, wait a minute. If the church, according to you, was not until Paul evangelized the Gentiles, who's he persecuting? He's persecuting something before he even started his ministry. 
Well, wait, wait a minute. Oh, the church started uh, in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, but we don't need to do the feasts. Oh, really? What was going on in Acts chapter 2? Pentecost. Do. Oh! <laughs> Interesting. And he says, And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for, of the traditions of my fathers. That's the key right there in understanding Paul and the Judaizers and the Pharisees had, that had heaped so much tradition onto the perfect law of God, making it a burden for everybody. And he was zealous in the traditions of his fathers. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. What's in Arabia? Sinai. Mount Sinai. Okay, now think this through. He's on the road to Damascus, right? Yeshua shows up, knocks him off the horse, right? Blinds him. Eventually he gets his eyes healed and he says, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to ground zero. Do you really believe that Yeshua led him all the way to ground zero where Yahuwah the Father gave the commandments just to teach Paul to tell everybody else to throw out the Father's commandments? I mean, really? Did Paul go to Mount Sinai, where the law was given, to spend the rest of his ministry telling everybody to throw out the law? Does that really make any sense at all? No, of course not. This is what really blew my mind when I started looking into the Galatians issue. 1 Peter chapter 1. This is after Paul has already died. Peter's writing, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia. What? Peter's right into the Galatians. Wow. And he, that's what it, how 1 Peter chapter 1 starts off. And he reiterates that in 2 Peter when he says, this is my second letter that I'm writing to you. So you know that the second letter is addressed to the same people that were in the first letter. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he concludes by saying, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. So right there you know he's writing to the same people that Paul has written to already. Another confirmation he's writing to the same people. Galatia. As he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You Galatians therefore Beloved, knowing this beforehand, knowing that there are ignorant and unstable people twisting and distorting the scriptures, be careful, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people. So when everybody wants to throw you the foolish Galatians argument, take them to 2 Peter and show them that Peter's writing to the same people in Galatia, saying, look, there are people twisting and distorting what Paul's saying, and they're falling into the error of lawlessness. And oh, by the way, there's a reason why the Antichrist is re referred to as the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, and the lawless one. Lawlessness is of the spirit of Antichrist. Right? Famous last words. We always talk about that, right? When somebody really famous dies, they always want to know what's the last thing they said. You know, famous last words. Famous last words in the Old Testament. The last writer of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. Remember ye the law of Moses. Famous last words in the Old Testament. Famous last words, the last author of the New Testament is the Apostle John. And he's writing, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For, the, you know, if you're missing it, this is the love of God. Well, Jesus only had two commandments. How many of you have heard that one? Yeah. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, yeah, but the definition of loving God is given for us in the scripture. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. And in Revelation... Last book in our New Testament, or in the Bible in general. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Can it get any more clear? Well, just in case it can't, there is a, uh, a guy out there who's got a great video <laughs> on law and grace for dummies. Let me see if I can pull this up here. I always enjoy talking to intelligent audiences, and these precious little children are going to help me. Now, I'm going to name these children, and I want you to learn their names. I want to see if you can do what other audiences have done. The first one we're going to name, let's not name them. Let's just say when I point to this one, sin. 
What is it? Sin. Come on, everybody. What is it? Sin. Once more, Sin. this one is law. Who is this? Law. Who is it? Law. Sin. Law. This is grace. Who is this? Grace. Once more, grace. let's go backward. Grace. Law. Sin. That's very good. Let's go again. Savior. Who is this? Savior. Savior. Come on. Savior. Now, this one is gospel. What is it? Gospel. Let's see if we can go now. Sin, law, grace, Savior, Pastor Ortiz, we got another good audience. Now let's do it all the way to the end. This is? Sin, law, grace, Savior, this is preacher. Who is this? Preacher. And this one is church. What's his name? Church. church. Now, let's go and let's quote the Bible. The Bible says, who says? The Bible, the Bible says that Sin. is the transgression of God's law. Are you with me? Yeah. Let's do it one more time. The Bible says that Sin. is the transgression of law. Whoever hates Sin. must uphold the law. Whoever fights the law is upholding Sin. whether he likes it or not. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Come on, ladies and gentlemen, Grace. is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. Very good. Let's do that one more time. Grace. Is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. And the Savior. die that we might have Grace. which is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. And Savior. gave us the law. which is the good news about the now the Preacher. preaches the Bible. in his church. Now today you've got men fighting God's law in church. And they say that the law is done away with. You may go, darling. Now if you do away with the law, the Bible says where there is no law, there is no So you may go, darling. And if you do away with you don't need which is pardoned for sin, which is breaking the law. And if you don't need grace, you certainly don't need a who died that we might have grace, which is pardoned for sin, which is breaking the law. And in that case, you don't need a because it's the story of a Savior who died that we might have grace, which is pardoned for sin, which is breaking the law. And if that be true, what in the world do you need a and if you don't need him, he might as well throw away the... Pretty simple, huh? When you put it in those terms, yeah. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up here. God wants to bring the family home. And there's only two sticks. <laughs> Pick a stick, I like to say. We read in Ezekiel... <laughs> The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, the Son of Man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. And take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these things? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, who? I mean, not the Rothschild, Zionists, or... <laughs> Freemasons or the United Nations will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, gather whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. This has not happened yet. This is beginning to happen. The sticks are coming together. Why? Because there's coming a time when he's going to say, okay, you're ready now. Come join me. Let's go back to the garden where it all began. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, 
please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.